I think it hates me too, Sean. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I like never publishing use podcast it. episode number 32. Welcome to the Self-Publishing Podcast, where if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. And now, here are your hosts, three gods who spend most of their time up in the trees, Johnny, Sean, and Dave. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Self-Publishing Podcast, a podcast that's all about how to get your words out into the world without contending with agents, publishers, or the other gatekeepers in traditional publishing. I'm Johnny B. Truant, and from right to left... Sean Platt, Sean Platt, David Wright, and best-selling author C.J. Lyons, who we attempted to have join us after an intro where we would get our blokishness out of the way, and it just, I know people enjoy it when we go into lengthy discussions of why we weren't able to make things work, so. But anyway, so welcome to the podcast, C.J., it's good to have you on. Thanks for having me here. I can already tell it's going to be a great time. <laughs> it's going to be a very serious great, show. It's going to be a great well, time. If I had only known, I would have brought my puppets with me too, there, Dave. I mean, <laughs> you guys. Dave probably has some extras there. for you if you want. Yeah, I do. <laughs> However, the Sean Low Voluments uh, episode is still going on, so at least we still have that hangover. That's a good thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm doing it on purpose. Uh, fuck you and your mother. Yeah. So uh, without the uh, sexy intro that I played the first time, which is probably a good thing, and uh, without... Uh, oh, by the way, so the people who have sent me questions... Wait, 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 you're saying sexy intro? Is that because of... Did you guys hear who the publishing person of the year is? No. no. Oh, yeah. wait, wait, wait. No, 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 I want to say. It's um, E.L. E. James, right? E.L. James, that's yeah. right, that's right. <laughs> Now, that's the publishing person of the year, not the writing person of the year, I'm thinking. Uh, publishing person of the year by um, Publishers Weekly magazine just came out today. So yeah, I was assuming that that would be your sexy intro, you know, Fifty Shades of, you know. Play it, Johnny, play it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll play it. <laughs> oh, God. No, I won't play it. <laughs> the, um, yeah, we have the sexy caller. Um, so, anyway. It's my mother. <laughs> I, I will. I will mention though that we 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 are gonna have. We were talking about this. Um, we are gonna have an erotica writer on because it's a section of the market that is huge right now. It's not gonna be E.L. James, but um, I won't reveal who that is. I'm enjoying. I'm hearing myself from somebody. Yeah, that's better. No, it's not. <laughs> this show is epic. Um. All right. Well, hopefully that'll go away. So, uh, CJ, thanks for for being on. You, uh, because of, we're so professional, I don't have any sort of a, like a formal intro, but uh, we we know you through Joanna Penn because I know you're friends with her, yep. and she was on. And I've I've read a few write ups of a lot from Joanna of what you've done. And she, Joanna described you as having the hybrid model where you're doing self publishing and you're you're doing traditional publishing as well. So yes. I wanted to talk to you about that. You've sold um, tons and tons of books. What the thing that I saw, you said about 100,000 books a month. Is that accurate? No, not quite. Um, since July of last year, I've sold 1.1 million. Oh, wait, do the math. Yeah, that is almost 100,000 <laughs> books. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like that. <laughs> you know what you could do now is you could write a meta book where you say something about selling 1.1 million books, put an exclamation point at the end of it. Because that's what you can do when you top the million. That's oh. what John Locke did. Yeah, but if you write that book, you should probably be honest, unlike John with his fake reviews. <laughs> well, it was funny. It was someone was asking me, well, you know, did you get like some kind of, you know, award or something for doing that? I was like, hell no. I didn't even get an email. <laughs> I figured it but, out. But you get to stuff your pillowcases with money now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's better than an email. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I love it because I can actually um, <clears throat> use my self-publishing to boost my traditional book sales, but what I'm doing a lot of as well is using the traditional books as uh, a way to augment the self-published material. So it, it's a win-win for me and my how, readers. How are you, when you say augmented, how are you able to do that? Do you control like the calls to action in the end that are sending people to your mailing list or how is that working? I don't control those in my traditionally published book, although I have been trying to um, explain to my traditional publishers and show them 
how important that is. Uh, we had, I put a call to action for the traditional book in the back of one of my indies before it came out, and we had over 300,000 downloads of that ad, wow. that I call them teaser ads, mm -hmm. and uh, it really drove the pre-sales, and they were very impressed by that and kept saying, wow, these are great pre-sales, and I was like, yeah, guys, hello. Yeah, they got to <laughs> reciprocate, though. They got to reciprocate. That's yeah, okay. well, that's, you know, that's the thing is you got you to gotta try to work them and bring them along. Um, but no, it, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, uh, I most of my success came after hitting number two in the New York Times list of a self-published book. Uh, it was The Help, Me, and then Lee Child. So talk about your crazy menage a trois. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, the traditional publishing, definitely, I love doing it. I love working with them. I love getting books out in the bookstores, mainly because right now my readers still really like that. Yeah, but they it, they definitely have a learning curve that is much steeper and slower for them than it has been, I think, for self-published people. I thought it was a non-learning curve. Well, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I was worried about that actually, uh, but I actually just signed a new traditional deal to move into YA. And oh, that's one of the cool. reasons why I signed it is because the publisher we had a little auction, and the publisher that came to us. Uh, they showed that they were innovating. They had a whole plan of action for marketing. Oh, that's cool. Is that so they came they back. I don't know why he left. Did we scare him off? He, he, he <laughs> routinely he routinely leaves, and it's a shame because today he's the one with the with the good audio. Uh, Sean is usually our talker, um, but now it's we need Dave. We need Dave today. And oh, and Sean is now frozen with a really perplexed look on his face. So I'm gonna see if I can screen capture it so I can show him later because it makes him look awesome. Can you hear me now? Yes, can. I can hear you now. Okay. And uh, we now have two Sean's again. <laughs> so awesome. Two Sean's. Wow. So, so CJ, I have a question for you then about cuz you you talked about a lot of your viewers understand the I'm sorry, your readers of traditional books, they still understand that the model of the bookstores and so forth. And Sean and I are are teaming up on something right now and I want to take when we have three novellas, so like the length of basically an average novel, I want to do a print edition of that. Because I think that we're so, we have three Sean's, three <laughs> Sean's. Because uh, I think that a lot, I think that we've gotten used to the idea that self-publishing is where it's at. And I think that um, maybe financially and velocity-wise it makes a lot of sense and it is where it's at. But don't a lot of people still understand that model of going to a bookstore and reading an actual paper book more? Well, they understand that more because it's familiar. But I think the key to all this, and this is what totally changed my business plan and actually how I kind of got started into um, the self-publishing aspect, was something that you guys mentioned in your last podcast, and that is the connection with the reader. Yeah. And I started doing that because my um, traditional publisher was only putting out one book a year, and it's a series. And my readers are like, we need more. We need books faster. You know, you got to give us more. And so I actually physically began to buy books and give them away to my readers to use as Christmas presents. And I would personalize them to me. And let me tell you, the guys at the post office hated that because <laughs> the first year I did that, it was like 300 books I schlepped down to the post office to mail. Um, but then when I uh, heard about the, how easy it was to put books up on Kindle, and I had some manuscripts that had been edited by New York City Publishing and had never, for a variety of reasons, made it into the bookstore. And I had bought the rights back, so I owned the, you know, the final product that had already been edited. I put those out, and I began to give those away to readers nice. and use those to kind of augment the traditional publishing until a year later I realized, holy crap, I was making more money doing that than I was with the traditional publishing and selling more books that way. So then things kind of reversed. But I try to make every decision based on what do my readers want? What will make them just jump for joy with excitement or want to tell their friends or really, you know, want to either go to Amazon or go to a physical bookstore and buy the book. And part of that is knowing where your readers are. And demographically, my readers tend to skew a little bit older and a little bit more conservative. So 
this year and last year they were asking me, begging me to get books into bookstores. And I, I'm doing that. I have a feeling by next year that won't be what I'm hearing from my readers. Yeah, I think the ebooks are going to take over. Yeah, it, I mean, I, I, I think it happens constantly. But I think even this Christmas, uh, I think there will just be so many Kindles out there. And, and we'll, we'll yeah. really see it. Because one thing, when Dave and I first started, I mean, that, that's the number one reason probably that I – would choose to independently publish is that speed that you mentioned with one a year like I, I one a year like I can't imagine writing one book a year that's painful an idea but um but but beyond that just the whole when we first started we couldn't get our books reviewed because they weren't in print and all the review sites were like no we need a print book and, and I remember talking to Dave and thinking man this has an expiration date because a year from now it's it's going to be the other way around. We don't want to deal with a print book. We we only want to review stuff that's a digital file. And it just seems like a really yeah. immediately antiquated policy. Well, can I tell you guys something? I don't know if, if uh, you guys have joined them, but if you really are hurting for reviews, um, which fortunately for me hasn't really been a problem, uh, the Independent Book Publisher Association is very inexpensive to join, and they have a program where you can actually get your books onto NetGalley. There's a cost wow. to it, just like there is for traditional sure, publishers, sure. but you can get your books out there and get them out to professional reviewers, um, even being an indie published author. Oh, hmm. hey, Dave, you want to check that out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. you guys could join together and, and do your, your books, but that's something I just, I joined them about six months ago, and I have found them to be a very nice resource. They have a lot of educational opportunities. Um, they've helped me understand some of my business decisions better because I am so not a business person. Um, you know, math is definitely not my forte. <laughs> so uh, that's been quite helpful. Uh, but yeah, no, I'd highly recommend them. Um, the other thing I do for reviews is I have developed a cadre of readers that just love my stuff, my street team. And when I put a new book out, I give it to them a couple weeks ahead of time. And I say, hey, this is going to be the launch date. I'll send you guys an email. Read it. If you like it, if you don't like it, I don't care. As long as it's an honest review, I'd love to hear from you. Put a review up. And they do. Now, do you request that in their review they say they got a copy of the book? Or do you, does that not matter to you? I leave it up to them. Um, some of them are professional. That's reviewers. because you're smarter than Dave, just for the record. And they're used to, you know, they're used to saying that. Um, others are, you know, they're just regular readers that happen to, you know, enjoy my work. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I, I have a book that doesn't work for them. So I'll yeah. get a three-star review from a street team member and they'll Do write you ever me. Do get one-star reviews from street team members? Like, not yet. Not okay. yet. I haven't. Um, but I, I feel very strongly that most one-star reviews are actually good things. Cause like yes, when I, I, I agree. I totally agree. I don't argue with one-star reviews yeah. unless they're totally okay. insane. And even then, I just okay. leave them alone. I because they're funny, them. right? Like, yeah. And, yeah. And the readers are smart enough. They'll say, oh, I'm smarter than that guy. He's nuts. Yes, I totally agree. So, they make um, Dave cry. He yes, cries to no, sleep. No, no, <laughs> Dave, no. Embrace your one-star <laughs> review. A wonderful thing. Yeah. No, here's funny. We oh, we just released the Z, which is our hybrid title, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's with Amazon. Amazon, and we have, um, I think, 103 reviews as of this morning. 52 of those reviews, so more than half, are five stars. Right. And we have eight one stars that are like, you ripped off Hunger Games. And we're like, yeah, we said so in the product description. <laughs> like, we're not hiding this. But, um, but they, they're really, they were upsetting to him. And, and, and Dave asked our editor, do you think we should get in front of this problem? And do you think we oh. should, um, you know, do you think we should, right? Do you think we should answer them? And the guy, and, and, he said, no, I think you should celebrate all the people who are really into the book. It's yeah. doing well. I was like, yeah! I, 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 listen. I, I <laughs> merely <laughs> wanted to explain that it, it, the, 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 the Hunger Games is the very, very beginning, and then it completely goes in a different path. Don't explain shit to trolls. The people who are leaving right. you one stars aren't looking for an explanation. Okay, enough. <laughs> We're wasting <laughs> CJ's time with petty arguments. I, I listen I, I listened to back to all these episodes of the podcast, so I have more exposure to what our tendencies are than anybody else, and one of my favorite tendencies is the way that Sean speaks for Dave. 
all the time. It's constant. It's like it's like yeah. He's like he's like well, Dave does this and Dave does this and Dave thinks this. What <laughs> least if only Dave were here. <laughs> Dave's puppet? Or is Dave really Sean's puppet? I thought I felt a pain back here. <laughs> He's got the hand up him. So, CJ, um, you said that you aren't, that business isn't your forte, but how are, you, how are you developing this relationship with your readers? Because that's something that I think a lot of people miss and that we, we all agree with, but it takes at least what we've seen, some marketing savvy to understand you know, how to build a list of readers or contact them on Facebook or wherever. How did you start engaging with those people? Well, I started by giving away the books. Um, to people I who had, sent you letters or emails or what? Yeah, people that sent fan mail. I've always had, um, my initial website went up in I think 2004 and from the very beginning oh. I had a newsletter sign up and I've okay. always tried to give away free things to encourage people to sign up for that and to make it worth their while. In fact, right now, I still give anyone new that signs up for it, um, that's cjlines.net, um, <laughs> uh, you have your choice of one of my books for free. And these are full-length, 100,000-word novels, um, and I'll give you uh, one of them for free just for a signing up. A digital out. file or a... Um, it's a digital file. I do an EPUB or a Kindle Mobi file, and I just email it to people as an attachment. Yeah. And that way, it doesn't cost me anything, and it's easy for the um, the readers usually to just download it into their reading device. Did you I don't do use DRM? Did you do the um, the 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 thing where you went under the post post office? I'm hearing my echo again. Are, did you do that initially because the ebook revolution kind of hadn't really happened? Would you still do that today? Go to the post office and mail books? I now I only mail books for my street team. Uh, I'll do that a couple times a year. I'll just surprise them and send them an email and say, "Hey guys, you know I have this many extra books left over. Uh, I want to give them to you. You know, let me know which one you want. Let me know who you want to personalize it to." And uh, I just surprise them with that randomly uh, every now and then because I think you know it, it's nice to reward your fans. Um, but that's the main thing I, I've been doing. I, I really haven't had any huge contests or anything like that. I don't do any crazy stuff. I'm Facebook, I'm on there maybe once a week. I'm not very good at social media. I tend to be a hermit. I just want to write the books. But honestly, that's what my fans keep asking me more, is they want more books faster. And by the end of this next month, the end of the year, I will have either published or turned in seven manuscripts this year. This Not year, much. I'm just been working my butt off because yeah. I, I think that there's going to be a saturation of the market coming next year, and I want to be in front of that and have my name out there yeah. and be familiar enough with readers, um, you know, because even after a million books, there's a lot of people out there that haven't met me. You know what? You're, when you say you don't have a business sense, you're totally wrong. You, your, your instincts are fantastic. Like really. I, I kind of think of it more as as uh, relationship building. You yeah, know? but that, but good business is relationship building. It, yeah, and what you're, oh, okay, well. what, and what you're describing is something that we we talked about last week, and we've talked about before. The idea that the paradigm is now shifted, and you have to find the people and bring them to you. And that kind of, I mean, from what I've seen, almost makes you bulletproof in a way because you don't have to worry as much about you know people finding you in all the mess they 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 are already know you and they already love you now, right and, and she's also talking oh, I'm sorry go ahead Dave on, on the street team thing do you like do you give the the same people every time or is it like different people you like spread it out how do you do that well usually um, I'll tell them I have this many books um, to give away usually it's like you know 40 or 50 and I'll just say, you know, email me, let me know if you want to give it as a friend, um, you know, and if there's more than 50 people, I'll just do a random drawing. Uh, but a lot of these guys on the street team have read all my books. So when they're asking for more books, it's usually gifts to give to other people. So it's a win-win because I get potentially a new reader, they get something that they can give away, uh, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so far I haven't had to really limit it. Um, I try to keep my street team fairly intimate. I think there's only about 200 people on it. Uh, and that way it's the people that are really interested in um, reading my books and getting the word out, as opposed to just my regular reader list, which has had over 14,000 people sign up. 
and those people sometimes are responsive if they have the time. Sometimes um, there, it depends on the type of book. Right now I'm focusing more on my mainstream FBI series, but a lot of those readers also enjoy the more romantic thrillers that I had done in the past, so you know, it kind of depends on what they're into. Um, it's really weird though with the mainstream FBI series, my readership has grown to almost 55% women, 45% men, which is a huge yeah. male, uh, to, to, you know, for them to bother to sign up for my mailing list. That's just incredible. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and <clears throat> I lost my trail. Never mind. <laughs> the, uh, what I like about this is that you're, you're validating in slightly different words everything that we've heard and that we believe and talk about on this show, which is uh, connect with readers. Write, write good books. stuff, write a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I saw that in one of the things you did with Joanna. You said write more books, create yeah. more content. Um, I, I mean, I'm j I, because it, it says that what you have done can be replicated. I mean, obviously, there's something to be said for your stories and your talent, obviously, but the idea that you, you, you didn't just get discovered. You didn't have the lightning strike. No, this was the sort no. of thing where you built that readership yourself, and then you can uh, take I that and take it anywhere. I've, I've seen that happen to friends. I've had friends that have been the anointed ones for publishers and have really gotten the push. And a lot of times that will work for the short term, but then they kind of plateau. So I've developed a secret formula. So I'll, I'll share it with you guys if you want. Well, it won't be a secret anymore, but as long as you're okay with that, we are too. Okay. Well, five of our listeners will. <laughs> we got yeah. lots of listeners. Okay, so here it is. This is some magic formula because this is like the emails I'm always getting from writers. There's, you know, I want to write a book. Show me how. Show me how to achieve your success. Here it is. Step one, write a great book. Step two, give it time to find readers. That's what everyone doesn't want to do. They don't want to do the yeah. give it time part. Step three, encourage the readers to tell their friends. And step four, repeat, which is the other part that no one wants to do because that means more work. <laughs> That's my favorite part. Repeat is my favorite part by far. I love that stuff. <laughs> and somewhere in there you're collecting a list so that you can actually reach out to those people to tell them to tell their friends, right? Yeah, but I mean that's that's passive. I don't do that actively. That just sits on my website, and um, I have a link to it on my Facebook page. But I have about five thousand people on Facebook, and I doubt if more than ten percent of them are also on my mailing list. So it's it's interesting how it's two separate groups. Um, so I'm trying to teach myself to interact with the Facebook people a bit more dynamically because it seems like that's why they're there. And if I use Facebook for myself personally, I might be more comfortable with it, but I don't use it for anything, so I have to figure it out. So I, I have a couple questions for you on the mechanics for the self-publishing stuff. I, you know, I didn't look. I probably should have. You mentioned that originally you were, public, you were pricing things at 99 cents. Are you no. still doing that? No, no, no. I, I've always priced my full-length novels, their regular prices, at 4 dollars oh, okay. So I what was I finding? special limited time sales mm -hmm. of 99 cents gotcha. when I want to raise money. Uh, the first month I was on Kindle, I did that because it was the month of the Haiti earthquake and we raised about $2,000 for Doctors Without Borders. Um, I did that as a special reader uh, uh, gift to my readers, reader appreciation sale, and that's what drove Blind Faith onto New York Times list was it had always been $4.99 and it was my best selling book and I put it on sale for, for one month at 99 cents and I just I sent an email out to my readers and I said listen I want to make a dream come true, will you guys help me? I want to hit the top 20 of Amazon Two weeks later, it hit the USA Today at number four, and a week after that, it was number two in the New York Times list. So my readers really helped to get the word out, and um, I mean, they rock. I, I couldn't do any of this without them. They're the real heroes. And in fact, right now, we are using um, my book rankings to drive um, more charity fundraising. I have a new program called Buy a Book, Make a Difference. And we've raised twelve thousand dollars this year for charity, and created six scholarships so the police officers can receive forensic training, um, which is very near and dear to my heart um, because I had a friend when I was a pediatric intern who was murdered, and the scholarships are in his name. Uh, my name's not on there at all; it's all about him. 
But uh, so I, I just can't say, you know, I'm just so lucky that I have readers that are, are true heroes and that they're willing to read what I love to write but pass it on and, and share the experience with their friends. The question that I'm surprised Sean didn't jump down your throat to ask after that, which I will now ask, <laughs> is um, are you able to use any of the KDP free promotion or are you in too many places? I, um, when they first opened up the KDP Select last year, I put a couple books in there to just try it. And I found it useful, but the 90 days is a little too long for my readers because they, there are, I do have about 20% of my readers aren't Kindle people that they want to buy from Sony or, or Barnes and Noble or uh, Kobo. So they were very frustrated by the length. So what I'm trying to do now is take my least selling standalones so that I won't mess with the people that are trying to follow books in a series. And I'm going to put those in KDP Select over the holiday season and see how that works. Um, because I think that way it will be, I can keep my readers happy, but I can also use those books to help promote the new material because I have some new books coming out in uh, February. Well, I think that the difference is you already have a, a big uh, existing audience where you don't know where they're reading, where Dave and I are just developing our audience. So if we stay at Kindle, we're not really... The only people we upset a little bit were because we recently actually pulled off yesterday's gone and made it exclusive because the mm -hmm. only thing we had was was that and it was out there and it wasn't really serving us because every time we make something free, for example, we made yesterday's gone free this week and we've had 25,000 downloads on it. So that's those are lifetime readers, some of them, you know, certainly nowhere near all of them, but some of those people will be our fans for a long, long time. And now, that's does, the value. Does, Dave, understand though, you're going to get more one star reviews, sweetie. Oh, I, I know. No, we, we, we talked about that. We, he, he said he's totally prepared. He's okay with it. I want to talk for Dave. What's the full price of four ninety nine? I, I, you know, I almost always only get four and five star reviews. It's not till I dare to put them on sale that I yeah. get one star review. Yeah, every time we've done free and we get picked up by Pixel of Ink. And we get, you know, a big wave of, of downloads. We always, that's where our one stars come from. Yep. And, and it's funny too, because, and this is the same thing happened with Z when they were pushing it. And it was a pretty good deal. It's one ninety nine for the whole, you know, series. And we just, you know, we were in, we were in the top hundred. We got a lot of downloads. So of course we're going to get more hate. It's the difference between somebody who decides that's the book they want to get, or a friend tells them, you got to check this out. It's a different reader. Yeah, totally different it is. Reader. It is totally different reader. But here's the thing. For someone that's picking up a book for free, a lot of those are what I call hoarders. Yeah. They're yeah. just filling up their Kindle. Yeah. Um, it's like the people that go to the garage sales and bring their own bags <laughs> and fill them all up. But My the mom. fact that they chose your book to actually read <clears throat> of all of those books on their Kindle, right there is an honor. And if they've finished it and left a review, even if it's a one-star review, I think that's still very, um, you know, that's a positive, not a negative. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't have a problem with the one-star reviews because also they're a balance. And some of our one-star reviews really do serve as almost five-star reviews for the right reader. You know, this <laughs> yeah. Really it's horrible too violent. language, it's too violent. And you're like, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, that's important. I was, for a while, there were Blind Faith, which is a, I would call it, well, I call all my books thrillers of heart because they're about the relationship yeah. more than the car chases and explosions. Although there's plenty of car chases and explosions <laughs> in them. Um, and it hit, it was number two on Amazon and it was number one on about like a dozen different bestseller lists including mystery and I got a bunch of one-star reviews from people that just automatically buy oh, the bestsellers on mystery thinking right. that it would be like you know a knitting cozy or something yeah and they were like this book isn't a mystery it's a thriller and I was like thank you yes you couldn't tell it from the cover <laughs> art from the fact that exciting. on the label it says a thriller <laughs> right Right. What, what, what? Okay. How about those reviews that are one star that are like, um, "This book was awesome, but it, Amazon it took two weeks to get here." One star. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, you gotta trust your readers. You have yeah. to trust your readers, and they're yeah. smart enough that if I they totally read this, they go, oh, "Okay, I don't have to worry about that." No, my big takeaway actually from what you were saying was um, 
not about uh, KDP Select, but for the first time ever, and I've, I've never thought of this before, I was thinking, oh, when we're off, I need to talk to Dave about, you know, maybe we take Yesterday's Gone and drop season one to 99 cents and see how we can push that because it's not like there's no funnel there. You know, if you read season one, yeah. you're going to read season two and, and three. Yeah. Some readers will want to. And that's a, almost a better promotion than free because A, it's hard to get people to open their wallet. You know, free is so much easier than 99 cents, but 99 cents is paid placement. It actually would go on a paid list instead. And then we ask our readers, look, this is a cool promotion and just see, I don't know. That's what you do though. You do it as a promotion. I wouldn't do it as the 99 cents forever model oh, because right. you want people to value your book. But that's yeah. why whenever I do special sale, like right now I have all three of my Lucy Gardino FBI thrillers on sale for two ninety nine each, and they're usually four ninety nine. And so I put up there and in their product description, special holiday sale, um, so people know it's a limited time. It's not going to last forever, and that they are going to go back up in the price. Just yeah. note, everybody who's listening to this, that the model is the same whether you're talking ninety nine cents or free, and it's really very validating. Um, is is you build a, a group of people who like you, who like your books, you know, email lists, whatever, your social media. You do a pro I mean, guys, tell me both on both ends here, Sean and CJ. Not Dave, Not though. Screw Dave. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> That'll talk for me. Oh, Dave. <laughs> is you, you do some sort of a promo, so a KDP select free promo or a 99 cent promo. You send your people to it. And then their activity drives it up the list where it becomes more visible to other people who don't already know you. Yes? Yes. Basically, uh, when I'm going to do some kind of promotion, I time it um, to start to about the same time I send out a newsletter. And I'll let my folks know on the newsletter, and then I'll post it on Facebook. And then I might send, uh, I don't usually send out another newsletter reminder because that's 14,000 people getting emails, and I don't want yeah. to be spammy. But I will post it again on Facebook or something like that. Twitter, maybe. Although most of my Twitter followers are, are writers, not readers. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's that. There's yeah. that debate we again. We know how that goes. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. And and I'm one of the people that you talked about last week about you know starting the blog for writers. But I did that knowing that they would not buy my books. I yeah. did that because I felt it was important to give something back. So many wonderful writers have helped me and given me great advice. And I wanted to take some of these resources like copy blogger and things like that and share them with writers that aren't exposed to that material usually. So I, you know, I knew going in that I wouldn't make any money, but it's more of a mitzvah. You know, it's yeah, something to, no. to give back. That's why we do this. That's why we do this podcast. It will also because we get to talk out loud and talk to cool people like you. I mean, it helps. It helps yeah. our brains all work a little better. Okay, wait. I, so I just figured it out. You guys are Penn and Teller. <laughs> <laughs> or Jay and Silent Bob. <laughs> I like oh, Jay and Silent Bob. There you go. That's even better. <laughs> or Big Bird and uh, Dracula. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, Dave says I, I That's I a sitcom. I'm going to write that. Nobody write that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so CJ, since you since you mentioned the podcast, you listen to podcasts. Would you say that the self publishing podcast is the key to all of your success? <laughs> <laughs> and can we use that, that as a quote? <laughs> <laughs> and would you encourage everybody to spend ninety seven dollars right there? <laughs> I would encourage everyone to listen to it. I would definitely encourage everyone to listen to it. It's uh, you guys got some good stuff in there, definitely. That's funny. When I love that talking. it's. I love that it's coming down to write good books. That's. I mean, we and hear so often, over yeah. and over. You know, because that's another. I think that's another common writer misconception is they get this idea that once with, it's more I think on the publishing end than the indie publishing end. I think the indie publishing is a little more um, work oriented. But there's this whole like writer myth that once you get published, like money falls from the sky and there's a big oh rainbow. My God. And you I made it. I can rest. To a river made of chocolate and start splashing around with unicorns, and it's just not true. You think you think you're Richard Castle eating bonbons? And, yeah. You know, yeah. No, right. I work harder at marketing and everything else that goes into my traditional published books than I do with my indie ones. Yeah. Um, and I'm not talking the writing or the content or the editorial part. I'm talking about all the stuff that comes after. And when you add it up, I get paid a lot less. I make yeah. probably 
I, for a while there, I was making more in one month with my indie stuff than I was in a year with my traditional stuff. That's and I'm paid pay. pretty well. I, I'm yeah. I'm a you know paid on a, a you know higher part of the scale than most people in traditional publishing. But the problem is, first of all, they move very slow. So you know what you're paid because most of it's in the advance, and that's divided over several years. Yeah. So you know you think, oh, I'm getting all this money. Well, it's divided over like two or three years, so it doesn't really add up to that much. Um. And I have to work my butt off because they don't know how to market me. They have no clue who my readers are. I know my reader demographics, <laughs> and I took them into my publisher, and his eye, he about blew. Wait, wait, wait. Repeat the part about how you're not good at business. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I just want to laugh at that again. Really? You're, no, you're, no, no. You're, I you're incredibly oh, savvy. Yeah. You know what? Math and business are not the same thing. Math and okay. business are not the same thing. And, and, and and it's you're great at business. You know your readers. You care about your readers. You 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 understand the value of a lifetime customer. You well, know, that's that's it. Is I do care about my readers, and I want them to to get my best and to do my best for them. So I wanted my publisher to do things that my readers would care about. And he looked at me and he said, "Well, we don't know who buys your books." I said, "Well, I do. Here they are." And I handed him my demographics. I thought his eyes were going to spin out of his head. He's like, we don't know who there? buys your books. That's what a publisher is supposed to do. Like, no, that's no. what they're supposed to they do. They sell to distributors. They know who distributes my books. They know what the guy from Walmart wants. They know what the guys from Barnes & Noble want. They don't know what the average person on the street who is buying wants. Can you see that's the a huge separation? disconnect, though. That is yeah, a huge, no. huge disconnect. And that's what they need to overcome. That's so, that's the business problem that they're facing. It has nothing to do with digital versus print or any of this other stuff you read about. It's the fact that for over a century, the publishing industry has been based on selling to about a dozen people, yeah. not an Come entire on. country worth of readers. Wow. Well, Joe, Joe Conrath has those stories about you know, the list was rejected because they said it, nobody would like this thing. And then surprise, surprise, when you put it in front of the people, they did like it. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, do you, I think any writer has that story, yeah. Do, do you face any friction from the publisher as far as them wanting to limit what you're doing on the indie side or not? Or do you have your... We are very careful with our contracts so that my indie work is not limited. And in fact, um, my current publishers came to me and I got their notice because of my indie success. Uh, I've been very fortuitous in my entire publishing career. Every, everything I've sold, the publisher has come to me. Uh, so I haven't really had to go through um, kind of the usual slush pile, you know, angst that a lot of writers have had to go through. Um, but they knew my indie success and when I show them how that can actually provide synergy and help their sales uh, they're very happy to take those extra sales um, you know they wish I would be 24 7 just writing for them but you know I if they're not gonna... yeah but they wouldn't want you writing 24 7 right that's well part they can't of the put problem. the books out fast yeah. enough yeah, yeah. So on your independent stuff, do you do you put any of that in print, or is your indie stuff digital only, and then your published stuff is print? No, I actually um, had so many readers that said, "Look, I bought all your eBooks, but I want a real book to put on my bookshelf," which to me is the ultimate compliment yeah, because cool. that means they want to invite you into their home and that you're part of their personality. They're yeah, part of what they right. reveal to the world. Don't take and that literally, Dave. <laughs> keeps going into readers' houses. Jesus. <laughs> but so I actually worked hard to get my books on the Create Space, but I was never able to get the quality that I thought my readers deserved. So recently, what I've been doing is partnering with a small press, and they do a wonderful job. These books come out gorgeous. They have like, um, you know, when the chapter starts, and I haven't seen this since I was a kid. They have these like pictures at the top of the chapter headings and these beautiful watermarks and uh, even on the thrillers they just look gorgeous so I they do my print work and that way I think my readers are getting a quality product it's worth their money and when it sits on their living room shelf it really says a lot about me and about them 
CJ, what do you think is a good, uh, because I'm thinking, I'm listening to you talking about partnering with small presses and stuff. Now, you've, you, you've, you've got some success behind you. You're making some money, so you get to, to play a little. If you have something where you've got a limited budget and, um, and you're, just, you're just starting out, what, what would be the key pieces of advice? I mean, I'm assuming you wouldn't go to a ton of expense to do print editions if that were the case, or would you? Well, CreateSpace is free. So other than paying for the cover art, you Do you know, think your time is better spent uh, doing print editions of existing works or like doing something different, writing on new... Well, here's what I would do. If I was just starting out, I would take any money that I had, and after I had the first book finished and was pretty well along on the second book. And I would make certain that those books, those first set of books, uh, would kind of be aimed at the same readers, so that you're keeping your reader happy and growing your readership, not dividing them. So I wouldn't do like uh, an Amish inspirational for my first book and a vampire erotica for the second. You know, try to keep Damn. it in the family. Um, and then I would use, um, before I publish, I would use some of my money to invest in an excellent copy editor, if you could afford it, a developmental editor, although they're very expensive, um, and a professional cover artist. Um, when I hired a professional cover artist, my sales literally doubled within a month. Uh, it really made all the difference. And they branded the books so that they were all, you could tell at a glance it was a C.J. Lyons book. So I think that money is very well spent. Um, what I spend money on right now is, is I hire two copy editors for each book, one proofreader, and sometimes a developmental editor. It depends on uh, the book and how rushed I am and if my critique partners are free, because I have critique partners that are just as good at developmental editing as anyone else. So I would put the money in that first. then. If you couldn't do the create space on your own, although now they have these templates that are very easy to do the formatting yourself, but if for some reason you couldn't, I would probably save that as a second step and spend, and that's actually fairly inexpensive to buy, uh, to find a formatter to convert it for create space. That's usually like $50 to $100, so it's not a huge amount. Uh, but that would be step two. So my priority would be the ebook first, getting that quality product that readers are going to fall in love with and recommend to friends, get the next book out, get the next book out, then you can start looking at things like, you know, taking extra money to go into print if you didn't have the time and the savvy to do that yourself. Yeah, that's now, as far else. as standing advice, especially from someone who with no business sense, <laughs> it's it, really it, good it, stuff. <laughs> as far as copy editors, uh, where's a good place for a, a new writer to go looking for them? Well, now, see, that's tricky because you really want one that's familiar for genre because a good copy editor isn't about just the semicolons and the misspelled words and the hominins. It's about, you know, what are the genre expectations? What do your readers expect? How can they help you meet them? What research can they double check for you? Um, it's, you know, it's, it's about a lot more than just proofreading. So I would start by looking um, at people in your genre Look at the acknowledgments in the books they've published and see if they mention an editor. Uh, also, there is a freelance editing society, and you can go to them, and they have the rates, too, that are the recommended rates, so you can make certain you're not, you know, getting kind of screwed or anything. And then I would talk to other writers in your genre and ask them who they used. Um, there's tons of writers loops out there for indies as well as traditionally published authors, and, you know, we, sh we share information like that all the time. But it's important that you do find someone that you're comfortable working with and that understands your genre. Hmm. So do you just maybe this is a good question to sort of wrap up on for um, people who are interested in the hybrid model like you're describing, because I think a lot of people have that goal. I want to be published and published is still with a capital P, meaning that you appear on a <laughs> bookshelf at Barnes and Noble or in airports or something. And I think that the, that, that has flipped to where maybe the query agents blind to, 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 I'm sorry, query letters sort of sent blind to agents maybe doesn't work as well. I mean, do you think that an indie publishing career might be a good place to start, even if your end goal is traditional publishing? Oh, yeah. I think the cool thing about um, publishing right now is that it's become the destination, and there are so many roads to get there. 
So, you know, I know a lot of people that start out with the goal of traditional publishing and end up being so happy doing it on their own that they're really not interested. And other people that truly see the indie publishing as kind of their query letter. You know, it's like, hey, instead of just one sheet of paper trying to describe my book, you get the whole book, you know, with sales figures and demographics and reader comments and reviews attached to it as a project. So it's kind of become the new business card or query letter in some ways. I do think though that finding the right agent, even if you're going to stay indie, is so important. Um, I My agent doesn't make any money off my indie publishing, but she does make money off my indie sub rights. So we've sold to, gosh, probably over a dozen foreign countries, um, audio rights. Um, she's always on the phone with my film agent because, you know, we've had interest in books. No money on the table yet, but, you know, that's how Hollywood goes. Hmm. Um, so that's where she spends her time, and that's where her money will come from, aside from the money that she'll also get from my traditional publishing contracts. So finding the right agent to work with is still, I think, a very valuable thing. If you're, do you think that an agent is necessary? We had this discussion a little with Joanna. I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. I think an agent is necessary unless you're someone that has. as much competition as you know if you have if you look at the so like, how long have you guys gone on while I haven't been recording you about a minute and <laughs> <a half. laughs> that's spectacular okay every <laughs> I lost him again <laughs> oh wow <laughs> um <s> <laughs> wow this is like our best technical glitch show ever <laughs> okay so let me see if I'm going to stay on this time. Now there's two of me. I paused the recording a long time ago. I don't know which version is going on to YouTube, by the way. Like, I don't know if YouTube is watching you guys. YouTube was the show before and this. They missed the last minute and a half of Agent Talk, though. But I'm wondering if I've been, if me standing, because I don't do anything, by the way. I don't leave and come back. I just sit here and wait when everybody freezes. Okay, we went off the air, and now we're back on the air. So, so you think that it, that it did an edit for us? Yes. I, well, I think there's a blank space, and then it goes. So, oh, well, weird. Okay. We should just probably wrap it up, though, now. Oh, Sean's back again. Well, well there's two of me and two of Sean. <laughs> there's three of you, Johnny. Yeah. This is... This is absurd. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so for the, for the people that missed what I was saying about agents, unless you have the, the contacts to sell your foreign rights or your audio or film rights yourself, I think an agent is a very helpful partner. Um, but remember, they work for you, not the other way around. They're just one of your team players. Do you worry about that anywhere near the beginning, or do you worry about that once you're successfully making good money selling indie titles or published titles or whatever? If you don't already have an agent, I wouldn't worry about it till after you get some good books out there. Um, but it's a it's a great time to start doing your research and to talk to other writers because there's a lot of people that call themselves agents but really <laughs> don't aren't they, yeah stay away from them. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, everybody. So uh, I hope that that was coherent through the glitches. I apologize for um, for all of that, but thank you, CJ, for being fault. on. 
<laughs> cjlions.net. So after this conversation, you should go to cjlions.net and sign up for CJ's newsletter. And she also has two uh, self-publishing uh, books out. Books on how to self-publish? Where, what uh, are those how to, how to, Writer's books. Oh, I have um, Break Free from the Slush Pile, which is more aimed at getting into traditional publishing, and um, uh, character-driven novels, uh, which um, and you can also, probably the better place to send people, though, if they want more information, is the norulesjustright.com. That's the blog that shares everything for free. Okay. Excellent. Okay, well, with that, I will just uh, say thanks for being on. It's been fantastic Thank despite so all of the craziness. There's, there's Sean's tiny little voice off in the distance, like a little mouse. And uh, with that, we'll just say uh, take it easy, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time, hopefully without as much crap. Okay, so it's a tiger.